Here this morning, we look at our message, A Great Commotion About the Way. In Acts chapter 19, if you have a Bible, you want to open up to Acts chapter 19, verse 21, through the first verse of chapter 20. Paul the Apostle has been ministering in a town for three years. And when you live your life in Christ Jesus and when you share that life with others, in this case, for a three-year period of time, through the gifting and the anointing of the Spirit of God as an apostle, there was unusual miracles that took place. There was just really supernatural dynamics, so much so that the gospel began to spread all, all over Asia. We know as we put the pieces of the New Testament together, about nine churches were planted after this three years uh, of ministry that was going on. And it has to be a record for Paul the Apostle to get three years without a riot. Uh, he almost makes it out of town without the riot, but it doesn't call it a riot here. It calls it a great commotion. This great commotion affects the entire city, as the text tells us, and it's, it's about the life of Jesus. And what, when you live your life for Jesus, whether it's in your workplace or in your family or school, and, and you give it time, like a three-year period of time, for your witness and who you are in Jesus to begin to work its way out, sometimes it it causes some conflict. Sometimes it causes some great commotion. Sometimes your teammates don't like you or your classmates don't want anything to do with you or the, the close childhood friend abandons you. And, and there can be conflict and commotion that goes with this life in Jesus. And yet as we see this, it's great to see how uh, the Lord brings about a peaceful resolve. He brings about deliverance kind of from an unlikely quarter of life, and uh, we'll be talking about that. But first, before we get into that, verses uh, 21 and 22 are just a couple of verses about Paul's plan to travel, the travel plans, if you will. And it says, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. This is an important statement. I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. In this two-verse travel plan, he's getting ready to leave town. He's going to send Timothy and Erastus through Macedonia and Achaia to prepare an offering before he gets there. They're going to receive the offering from the Gentile churches to take back to Jerusalem when you put all the pieces of the New Testament together. And Paul's going to go around and do that and then head to Jerusalem. But it says that he purposed in the Spirit, meaning that there was a spiritual uh, drive inside of him to do this ministry trip through Achaia, through, through Macedonia, Achaia, Jerusalem, but then he's going to go to Rome. Now we see the rest of the book of Acts tells us how Paul the Apostle got to Rome. And it wasn't anything like the travel brochure said it was going to be. He was going to get arrested and beaten and thrown in jail. He was going to be uh, there waiting for some time. Ultimately, a Roman centurion is going to take him on a trip to Rome. And so uh, he's going to go to Rome. And those who are going to pay the, the price, if you will, is the Roman government to take him before Caesar Nero. Well, well, that's all well and good, but then on the ship, he has, they have this terrible storm, and they have to throw everything overboard, and then they're going to run aground, and ultimately, uh, on pieces of debris, those who could swim could swim, and those who couldn't, they had to float on debris onto the island of Malta, and as if you haven't been through enough on your way to Rome, uh, then they travel, they gra uh, grab some sticks to throw it on a fire, and there's a poisonous viper that comes out of the sticks and bites Paul's hand and he has to shake it off in the fire. You see, when he says here that he purposed in the spirit that he must see Rome, he had no clue what the next couple of years had for him in store. You know, it's that way, isn't it? Here's a bit of the prophetic in Paul's life. Sometimes God puts a purpose of heart, a drive inside of us by a spirit to do something. And we go, oh, we want to move here. We want to take on that job. We want to embark on that adventure. And we have in our mind, we have in our heart, we have a vision of how that's going to play out. I don't know about you. Have you ever thought about taking a job that it didn't play out quite like you thought it was going to play out? Have you ever moved to a place that you thought this is going to be paradise and it turned out just a little different than the travel brochure? 
Have you, have you ever, you know, you might be, you know, God might be stirring you up and some of you are getting ready to do, depart from our midst and you have this flowery vision of what's awaiting you and you're going to move away. And a couple of years from now, you're going to look back and you're just going, wow, that's nothing like I thought it was going to be. Some of you have ended up in Idaho Falls that way. You don't even know why you're here. You've blown into Idaho Falls, this one horse town. You look around and how in the world did I end up here? This is not what I had in mind. And here you are in our midst hanging out with us because you have no choice. (laughs) It's great to see that God has a plan in the way he moves his people around. And and so that's just a little glimpse of what's coming up for the rest of it's a coming attraction, if you will, for what's going to go on in Paul's life. But he almost gets out of town after this three years. But it says in verse 23, and about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. I love that phrase. It doesn't say a riot, but it's the closest thing to a riot. A great commotion about the way, the Christian way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of a similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. So here's a guy. His name is Demetrius. And Demetrius is in the job uh, as a jeweler, if you will, making silver shrines, little gods. Now, the temple of Diana at the time is one of the seven wonders of the world. Its architecture for that era around the first century was spectacular. Here's a little artist rendition that you can uh, check out anywhere. This is an incredible, one of the seven wonders of the world. This uh, building is 450 feet long. It's a football field and a half long. Think about that. 225 feet wide. It's 60 feet tall, like a six-story building, and it has 127 columns of it. It's, it, it, it's amazing, um, the architecture of this. And so this is what Paul was dealing with. Now, Demetrius was making these little silver idols that looked like, well, the goddess Diana this woman right here. Now, according to their uh, myth or lore, there was a a black stone that fell from, they said Zeus, but from heaven, most believe it was a meteorite that fell to planet Earth, kind of a blackish stone in a crude rough figure of a female with multiple breasts. And it had become basically the cult that was the centerpiece as one of the seven wonders of the world of Ephesus. And so Demetrius and his buddies, it says that he called up those who are of like occupation. They made their money. They prospered in this way. No doubt if you're a guy that sells little idols like this, little trinkets of people that come to see one of the seven wonders of the world, man, they had a lucrative financial business. And so he gets all of his buddies together. Maybe they had the... um, idol-making union. Maybe they're union guys. And they called up, you know, the, the head of their union, the guild, if you will. And I don't know what you would call it, you know, Diana Silver Making Union. They all have a number, you know, union has always had like Union 105. I think the Union 666, I think that was their, their number. Anyway, they, uh, they gather all of these workers together and they said, hey guys, we're going broke. Now, I love this. Paul the Apostle's preaching the gospel in Ephesus was making idol makers go broke because he quotes Paul here, and he says, this Paul throughout almost all Asia says this at the end of verse 26, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Now, I think that's a pretty logical, defendable statement, don't you think? If my human hands make a little bitty God that I'm going to sell to somebody else that they can pray to this God. This God will protect them. This God will be good luck for them. They'll get good fortune if they have this God. But my human hands made it. Paul said, gods that are made with human hands are no gods at all. 
Wouldn't you agree with that? That's a logical statement. If a human can make a God, I just think about it this way. If you can